Good morning. I'm Deb Wathen Finn, class of 74. Yay. Yeah. Sorry, we just had to get that in, out of the way, right? Bro, as chair of the Alumni Council and president of the Alumni Association, I'm honored to introduce you today. So today, 14 years later, Colby is a totally different place. And when I thought about this, about talking about you today, Everyone knows I love infrastructure, right? And I just can't believe, um, Whitney King showed a picture at the Boston event to thank you, and he showed an aerial map of Colby. And the physical plant, I think we all say that, and if you come up regularly, it looks more incremental, but it's just very powerful. Under Bro's leadership, there are either not, there are major renovations that have happened to our facilities and new buildings, a total of nine in 14 years. But I think the part that we all really care about, and we appreciate the stewardship that you've brought to this institution, is that human infrastructure side. Today, the campus stands as one of the, um, stands out in its peers in the nation on its commitment to the environment. Because of your leadership, we have the biomass plant, we've reached um, zero um, carbon neutrality, we have an environmental program that just is first, nobody can beat us on that one, and this fabulous partnership with Bigelow. And then, I know we all care about this, and it's usually part of the questions from either the parents and alumni. Bro has really helped the board think about the increase in um, financial aid. The financial aid capacity has increased 160%, there's a 160 percent increase in the financial aid capacity. Thank you, bro. And, a, and one of the most, diver, the most diverse student body that we've ever had internationally and of all different affinities, thanks. Bro, you've clearly made a difference. We're all asked, we come into this world and you wanna make a difference you've made a difference and you've had such an impact on this institution in so many other ways. And we thank you for that. And thank you for leaving this institution in such a wonderful place as we move forward into the next leadership um, time period. So it's with mixed feelings. I welcome you today, bro. Now I'm gonna get emotional. I asked bro of how emotional he was today. This is bro's final state of the college. Bro, come on up. Please welcome Bro Adams. Thanks, Deb, and, and good morning, everyone. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, on this uh, beautiful weekend, boy, the campus looks great, doesn't it? And the, and the weather is fantastic. I'm glad to see all of you here, and I'm I'm really pleased that you've come to, to this uh, particular moment. Uh, as many of you know, I think it's my custom on this occasion uh, to review recent accomplishments and talk about our plans for the coming years. Since this is my last appearance uh, before alumni at the State of the College address, I thought I would do something a little different today, and I hope it's okay uh, with you. Instead of looking ahead, I'd like to look back uh, a bit and take a deeper look at where we've been uh, not just in the past several years, but during my time at Colby over the past 14 years. I, I like to say almost 15 years. Um, <laughs> sounds better somehow. Uh, and I want to pay particular attention what we have accomplished uh, here together. Everything good and important that happens at Colby happens as a result of teamwork, uh, both here on the campus and with our broader uh, community around the country and around the world. And I would say among the various forms of teamwork, uh, the teamwork between the president and the alumni of the college is uh, particularly important. This has been especially true, I think, during my time here. And as the college environment generally uh, has become more and more competitive, and as the resources available to institutions have become more decisive in their ability to differentiate themselves from their competitors, uh, this has been especially true, as I say, over the last uh, th uh, decade and a half. Um, as I've always done on this occasion in addition, and uh, as I want to do again today, I'd like to hear your questions and comments, so I'll be brief uh, in this, uh, and so we have some time um, for 
that conversation as well. And I would just apologize uh, quickly in advance for any of you who are at, at the Sloop Hero Society dinner in uh, January. You're going to see a couple of the same slides, uh, but I hope you will endure them again. So let me begin uh, in a place where Deb also uh, mentioned uh, the, the work of the past few years. No accomplishment, I think, over the past 14 years has been more important than the expansion of opportunity and access to a Colby education through financial aid. Since 2000, uh, Colby has added uh, more than 150 endowed scholarships for a grand total of 693 uh, as this year uh, began. Restricted endowment for financial aid now totals approximately $231 million, or about 34% of Colby's endowment as of June 30th, 2013. Endowment for financial aid was, as many of you know, the largest single piece of the Reaching the World campaign, garnering more than $50 million in total support over that period of time. As Deb also said, in part as a result of this remarkable success, the college is now able to offer 196, more or less, grants per class compared to 164 uh, in 2000, supporting more than 40% of the incoming class at Colby, up from roughly 32% in 2000. Over that same period of time, the financial aid budget has grown from $10.8 million to $28.3 million this last year. <laughs> Thanks to you, 160% increase. And as Deb also said, in addition to broader opportunity generally, a steady increase in the number of students from traditionally underrepresented groups has been made possible by this expansion of financial aid resources. The goal of increasing the number of such students has always been important at Colby, at least especially so over the last couple of decades, and we're making progress. In 2000, the first year class enrolled approximately 9% of its students from traditionally underrepresented groups. In each of the four years between 2009 and 2013, that number exceeded 20%, meaning that approximately 20% of the entire student body is now composed of students from American minority populations. I'm pleased to report the good news from Terry's uh, uh, area that for the class just admitted, the class of 2018, the proportion of students from underrepresented groups has grown to approximately 24% of the entering class. So we're ready to take another step forward. The story on the international front has been equally impressive. In 2000, approximately 5% of Colby's incoming class was made up of international students. This past year, that number had grown to approximately 13%. It's moved around 13% often, sometimes as high as almost 15% over the past several years. The difference can be accounted for almost exclusively by significant restricted annual gifts and endowments supporting financial aid for international students. The Davis United World College Program, World Scholars Program, has been particularly important, as many of you know, to Colby's capacity to recruit and enroll talented students from around the world. And that program, as you know, consists of restricted annual support from the Shelby Davis uh, Foundation. Every student coming to Colby, uh, with and without financial aid from this country's and others, now finds a remarkably broad and deep academic program to engage. That greater richness is due in large part to the growth of the faculty since 1990, going back uh, uh, another decade. Colby has added 36 faculty positions to its table of organization, and that growth has been fueled uh, in significant measure by gifts to endowment, creating endowed faculty chairs, given, some of them given by people in this room approximately 30 new chairs in all um, since 1990. Fully 27 of these chairs were raised during the campaign for Colby, led by Bill Cotter and the board between 1990 and 2000. In addition to supporting program expansion, endowed chairs have made it easier to recruit and retain top faculty by bolstering faculty compensation which I'm pleased to say to you today remains very strongly competitive among our peers and competitors, and also by providing research funds for those shareholders. Programmatic richness has also been fueled by gifts in support of the educational program. 
Since 2000, Colby has engaged in a number of strategic initiatives that have transformed the curriculum in a variety of ways. The list includes the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement, something I started working on uh, almost as soon as I came to Colby. The popular interdisciplinary concentrations in neuroscience, uh, the rapidly expanding environmental studies program, which I agree with Deb is one of the finest, if not the finest undergraduate program in the United States including now the recent offering in marine conservation in partnership with the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in East Booth Bay. Any of you getting to East Booth Bay or in that vicinity this summer, I'd urge you to stop by and see that incredibly uh, important new addition to Colby's strategic partnerships. Additionally, of course, the dramatically enlarged capacity of the Museum of Art to serve faculty and students across the curriculum the creation of a film studies program and the collaboration with the Maine Film Center in Waterville, the new minor in managerial economics, thanks to my colleague uh, Lori Kletzer, the addition of a strength and conditioning program uh, in athletics, and the endowing of the director of athletics position at Colby. Every one of these major developments was enabled entirely or in large part by philanthropy, virtually all of it from generous alumni and alumnae. Along with the curriculum, our teaching has changed in pretty dramatic ways in recent years. Undergraduate research, as many of you know, is now a staple of our practice, and we regard internship opportunities through which students are exposed to professional environments of various kinds as integral to what we do. Since 2000, paid internships Paid undergraduate uh, experiences supported by restricted endowments have multiplied from 5 to 27 last year. Likewise, endowed internships have grown in recent years from 2 in 2000 to 25 today. All of these experiences, enormously empowering to the students who have had them, were made possible by gifts, and gifts including uh, from people in this room. As Deb also mentioned, Mayflower Hill has been steadily transformed in recent years through philanthropy. The Cher Swenson Watson Alumni Center is a tribute to the philanthropy of the late Doug Cher and his roommates Tom Watson and Kurt Swenson. The construction of the Colby Green set the stage for the Alumni Building and also for the Diamond Building that went up at the other end of the Green shortly following. Next, the Pulver Pavilion and the new bookstore transformed Cotter Union to the great pleasure of students and faculty and others who use that important and central facility. Meanwhile, down the street, our athletic facilities improved dramatically with the addition of a new facility for field hockey and lacrosse, the Bill Alfon Field, and the Harold Alfon Football Stadium and Track, one of the finest facilities of its kind now in New England. Last summer, the dazzling new Alphon Lunder Family Pavilion opened to great public excitement and acclaim. I hope you've gotten by there. If you haven't already, you're in for a treat. And we look forward to dedicating the, Davis, the new Davis Science Center uh, in July, which is now up and, of course, complete. In all, the gross square footage of Colby's physical plant increased from $1.3 million uh, dollars, <laughs> feet, square feet, $1.3 million uh, square feet in 2000 to a bit more than 1.5 million today. This is an enormously impressive story of philanthropy, and as I said, the partnership between the college and alumni and friends, but it's not a new story. As I studied the college's history in preparation for the bicentennial, I was struck by just how constant and fundamental fundraising has been to Colby's welfare from the very outset. In addition to his role as first teacher and administrator. Jer Jeremiah Chaplin was also Colby's first fundraiser. Unlike those of us who followed, Chaplin had no grateful alumni or parents to seek out. <laughs> One can imagine how that work must have gone. And so he visited Baptist communities throughout New England, appealing to people who shared his conviction that a private Baptist college in central Maine was a compelling idea. Amazingly, he found people to give to that idea. The record doesn't say exactly how effective he was, but we know that when Gardner Colby gave the college its first real endowment in 1856, he did so in part because of his 
Gen uh, Chaplin's generous outreach to his mother and his power as a preacher of the gospel. Moving into the more uh, modern era, nearly modern era, fundraising also played a pivotal role in J. Seeley Bixler's time when something like a modern fundraising apparatus first emerged at Colby. President Bixler appointed the first director of development, John Pollard, and a year or so later, Ed Turner replaced Pollard and created Colby's first real development organization. There are people in this room, I know, who remember Ed, and also his legendary director of alumni programs, Bill Millett. Indeed. Bixler was not terribly fond of fundraising. Earl Smith reports that when Bill and Linda Cotter visited Seeley in 1984, shortly before his death, he confessed to being haunted by two recurring nightmares. The first was standing for his oral PhD exams and being grilled on the entirety of the history of Western philosophy. It's a nightmare that I can relate to personally. The second nightmare was being asked to go on another fundraising trip for Colby. <laughs> Notwithstanding his reticence, Colby made important fundraising progress in Seeley's time. The Ford Foundation made two substantial grants to Colby in 1954 and 56, anticipating the extraordinary gift of $1.8 million in 1962 during Bob Strider's presidency. And it was Bixler who prompted gifts of art from the Wing Sisters, from Ellerton and Edith Jetty, from Willard and Helen Cummings that came to form the core collection of the Colby College Museum of Art. The contemporary era of fundraising traces its roots to the game-changing Ford Foundation gift in 1962, and it gained impressive momentum during Bill Cotter's long and highly successful presidency. Bill led two campaigns, the Colby 2000 campaign and the campaign for Colby, which concluded in 2000 and raised an impressive $150 million. Everything that was done after including our own enormously successful Reaching the World campaign that ended in 2010, was constructed on the impressive edifice that was established during the Cotter years. As impressive as the last few decades of philanthropy at Colby have been, I am quite certain that the financial support of the extended Colby family will be, indeed must be, even more consequential in the years to come. We all sense that the days of the constantly accelerating price of a college education are coming to an end. We also know that this can't keep us from the crucial work of making Colby a better place and a more competitive place in the future. The resources we will require for that work will have to come increasingly from endowment and the philanthropy that fuels endowment. Every Colby person should be interested in this topic but there is one person who must be especially interested, my successor and Colby's 20th present, David Green. As you might imagine, David and I have talked about a lot of things over the last several months, but the thing that I have been most eager to convey to him is how deep is the affection among Colby alumni for alma mater and how much pleasure and sustenance he will find in that important company. That affection is manifest in many ways beyond the major philanthropic commitments I have mentioned so far. It's present in the crucial and broad-based support for the Colby Fund, which this year will enjoy, we hope, we think, something close to roughly 50% of Colby's alumni engagement. It is evident in the myriad ways in which alumni volunteer for various college activities and events both here on the campus and in cities around the country and indeed around the world. It's demonstrated in the various forms in which alumni reach out to students to help them with career participation, preparation, excuse me, while they're on Mayflower Hill and later as they make their way in the world following graduation. The spirit of giving and giving back in time and in energy and in resources thrives here at Colby, thanks to you in many different ways, all of them meaningful, all of them advancing the college's interests. In this spirit, I want to conclude this brief talk today, my last is Colby's 19th president, with an expression of personal thanks. 
The pleasures of being Colby's president are manifold and they are intense. But among the most important for me were and are the opportunities I've had to get to know the members of the extended Colby family, including those of you gathered here on this reunion weekend. I've seen many of you during my annual travels around the country, and I've met with a good many of you personally. I've learned many things from those encounters. But what stays with me, especially, is your love for the college and your desire to see it flourish. As was true of the founding generation of supporters 200 years ago, and has been true ever since, this love proceeds from nothing more or less than a deep commission, commitment to the mission of educating and empowering young people. It's as pure and noble a passion today as it was 200 years ago. In their Baptist way, our founders would probably have described this passion as a calling, and that is still a fine way of thinking about what we do and have done together. Thank you for your fellowship in this calling, for your friendship, and for the immense good you have done for Colby in my time as president. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to take some questions and hear comments. Uh, those are always revealing to me and, and very helpful. And we have a microphone, and I'd be grateful if people would speak into the microphone so we can all hear your questions. Are you at the point now where you don't have to consider financial uh, need, where, we, where you can give as much as possible? With respect to financial aid? Yes. No, we're not. And I think that's the next big challenge. Um, and personally, I would hope to see the college take it on and resolve it over the next decade or so. And, and the magnitude of this is roughly this. So we're at about 40%, uh, sometimes a little more, uh, in terms of the percentage of the first year class that receives need-based uh, grants from the college. Next year, averaging $43,000, the average grant next year. 56,000 next year, but, but so we need, but, but more importantly, the, the actual uh, financial aid numbers work like this. So we give about 200 grants per class to be need blind, that is to say to never consider, consider the ability to pay in an admission decision, which Terry would very much like to do. We will need uh, an additional 20 to 25 grants or so uh, if you do the math on that at $43,000, you come out to something like an additional $4 million a year once you get all of the classes loaded in to the system. So we would need another, the equivalent of another 80 to $100 million in endowment uh, to do that. I think that's within the college's reach over the next decade. I really do. And so uh, that's out there. Uh, I hope it's it's taken on by the board and David because I think it's the next logical step in the march toward uh, fullest expression of opportunity and access. Thank you for asking. It's a very important issue. Yes. Uh, Jonathan Allen, uh, 64. In the course of your talk, you mentioned attempts to slow, stop, or slow, at least slow down the continually rising cost of college education, uh, rather than just mitigating it by scholarships. What specifically uh, is happening to do that? I think you all heard the question, and it's one that's asked perpetually, I think, appropriately on this occasion. And I always start by saying that the cost driver for us uh, has not been, as some people would have it, simply the, the lack of ability to uh, constrain the expense base of the institution. What, what has primarily driven it uh, in the last three decades has been a competitive dynamic among institutions for the very best students 
uh, and for the attentions of the public. Uh, and that has pushed us, one institution against the other, to offer increasingly complicated um, and um, elegant solutions to, to the various uh, issues that we face uh, at the college and the challenges of offering the best possible educational and residential life experience. So we have all been struggling with one another to outdo the other uh, in building the greatest uh, science facilities and building the greatest athletic facilities and building the most comfortable and luxurious residence halls. I'm sure that as you spend time in these residence halls, they're a little bit different from the ones you remember uh, back in your days. Uh, and everything about the college is different. We've added um, a lot of square footage uh, to the college. Again, partly out of an interest to enhance quality, but partly also out of this uh, competitive uh, dynamic. And nothing we do is more expensive than adding square footage to the, to the base of the college. So the competitive dynamic is one of the real drivers of cost and has been the real drivers of cost over the last several decades. This has been reinforced, by the way, in the most perverse way, and you've all heard me complain about this before, by things like US News and World Report and the rankings game among and between colleges and universities. Uh, the US News methodology is driven uh, in great part by uh, expense per student and other measures of financial resources. And that, too, has led perversely to these expansive um, impulses. When is it going to end? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I thought, Doug Turp, our colleague and chief financial officer, and I thought it was going to be slowing significantly after the uh, recession. And in some ways that it has. Um, but in some ways it's been surprising how aggressive some of our neighbors have been and peers have been with respect to sort of reclaiming that old ground of being as aggressive as possible on the comprehensive fee increase. So um, I don't know when the end will come. I think it will come slowly, and I think it will affect the highest um, ranking institutions last uh, because they enjoy more demand than less highly ranked institutions. Uh, but it will come for all of us. And I think it will come um, by way of the market shift that needs to occur before institutions change their behavior. I think this will be a very mechanical, sort of brutal um, pressure of financial markets and, and the market in higher education. That's what's going to change it ultimately. Colby is as being as conservative as possible. Um, about this, but it's not in our interest to develop a very significant gap with respect to the level of the comprehensive fee. At least it's not in our interest yet. So stay tuned. And I hope you ask David Green that question next year. <laughs> yes, Peter. Uh, bro, looking ahead, uh, it seems to me that education is going to change over the course of the next uh, decade to two decades uh, in terms of online education and where we're headed in that direction. What effect will it have on uh, smaller uh, liberal arts colleges and how will they deal with it and what will happen in that direction and what does it mean for a David Green? I think it means a couple of things, Peter. Um, we will see information technology increasingly uh, important in the way we conduct the tr tr traditional or conventional mission. Lori Kletzer has uh, put some effort into understanding what we call the flipped classroom, uh, which involves the use of these resources uh, to import material uh, into the classroom and to permit faculty here, who meanwhile stay in the same sort of uh, stable student-faculty ratio at around 10 to 1, enable the faculty to free their time to do different kinds of things. And I think we're going to see a, an increasing migration of the way in which faculty spend their time with students. We hope less and less in front of people lecturing or doing things in volume of that kind and more and more in more intimate, engaged settings, undergraduate research, the smaller group work, 
uh, those kinds of things where the student-faculty ratio really pays off. So I think you're going to see a, a migration in the classroom. We will be taking advantage, I'm sure, of a ways in which to enable students to get exposure to material and subject matters that we simply can't do, provide. Sanskrit, I mean, I'll take an example which isn't really a lively one yet, but if we wanted, <laughs> if we wanted to do Sanskrit, uh, other remote and, and um, languages remote from us uh, physically and culturally, there may be ways in which we can use the technology uh, to provide those uh, resources without investing in program and faculty. I think that's another important way. Uh, I don't think it's going to upend the residential model of the liberal arts college entirely. I think it's going to change it in certain significant ways, some of which I've mentioned. I'm not one of those who believe the sky is falling in this regard. I think it will affect institutions in the third and fourth and fifth tier uh, of reputational standing. With respect to the top tier, which we reasonably occupy, I think there will continue to be a robust market for that product for a long time. But it's going to change the way in which we uh, manage our academic resources and particularly our faculty resources. And I think that's going to be the big change over the next 10 to 15 years. There are other people who have a more dramatic and kind of apocalyptic view of this. Um, Bill Bowen, the great uh, uh, President Emeritus of, of, of Princeton and the former president of the Mellon Foundation spoke here last two years ago on the occasion of the Bicentennial Lecture Series. Or was that last year? It was last year. <laughs> I'm losing track of time. Um, Bill, Bill agrees with this more modest and conservative view of what it's going to mean, and I agree with him. But there are people, as you know, Peter, who believe that it's going to uh, make the residential model of liberal arts learning, what, um, outdated, uh, unsustainable. I don't believe that, especially with respect to the top tier colleges. Yes, Jim, there's a microphone right behind you. Bro, you've devoted, <clears throat> I have two questions. You've devoted so much of your energies over the last 15 years to Colby and it had remarkable impact on the college and will for years and years to come. I wondered what has been the most satisfying aspect of that, personally. And the second question is, you're going on to a, a wonderful new position with the National Endowment for the Humanities. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and the challenges and, and what you see as, a, as kind of your new career path. There are two or three really uh, important zones of personal satisfaction. I've mentioned one today, the work that I did with alumni. I didn't like getting on and off planes very much, but I liked very much being in your company out in the world. It was, uh, it's a part of a president's life that is hugely important, not well seen or observed by people on the campus, but terribly important, and it was terribly important to me. And there was a lot of deep satisfaction in it. The other part, I think, and I mentioned teamwork, was the teamwork uh, with my colleagues here on the campus, the work of, of, of working on the, on the college, working on the curriculum, working on the physical plant, being together in this enterprise, I think that sense of engagement with other people in an important mission uh, day to day, as it, you know, getting up in the morning, walking to work, engaging in that teamwork was hugely um, satisfying. And I think that I was fortunate to have a great senior administrative team here. Uh, during my time and working with them in those ways and others and with faculty on the curriculum was hugely um, satisfying and of course engaging with students and watching students as I did at graduation watching students mature from these somewhat awkward uncertain uh, people who arrive their first year and watching them walk across that stage and understanding what they've done and seeing what they've done and then seeing them show up here uh, among you, uh, after a number of years, and w seeing their, just how impressive and impressively well uh, they've done. Uh, that's, that's, that's a hugely rewarding and interesting thing, and it's what, what gives one faith in the enterprise, I think. So those are a couple things I'd mention. Um, I'm supposed to be careful. I've, I've, I've uh, been instructed to be very careful about talking publicly about uh, NEH because as I think you all know I'm still in the pr confirmation process. Um, I, I will say that uh, a couple of things. One, I've been meeting with some people there in 
permitted ways, uh, sort of off-site, and I've uh, been enormously impressed uh, by the people I've met at NEH. Uh, this, I would also share with you another observation, and I shared this with a couple of people uh, in the last couple of days. I've spent a lot of time um, in and around the White House in this nomination process, and I've got to say that the people I've met working in the federal government have been without exception, particularly in the White House, because that's where I've been most uh, involved, have been enormously hardworking, very impressive in terms of their intelligence, and um, very impressive in terms their, of their commitment and passionate feelings about the work that they do. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I was, you know, I don't know what I was expecting, um, but, <laughs> but I, I have to tell you, it's been a very eye-opening and very, very um, affirming experience to be around these people. Um, so you should just know, so far, the people I've met in Washington have been just terrific and um, very, very impressive. Um, and they work under very difficult conditions uh, without a lot of compensation uh, because they believe in what they're doing. And so that's been, um, been really very satisfying. The last thing I'd say, Jim, and I'm, I'm being sort of uh, wandering around the edge of your question for, for, for reasons that I'd, I explained. I, I'll just say I think these agencies, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Science Foundation, are terribly important parts of or expressions of the federal government. And uh, I think I can say without violating uh, the advice I've been giving that one of the important jobs that any chair of these organizations has is to protect and advance the interest of the organization in the midst of all of this uh, deep, understandably deep and difficult uh, budgetary discussion that we're having, but as things which this country ought to care about and which carry a symbolic cultural significance that I think exceeds, uh, perhaps far exceeds, their actual uh, financial resources, uh, but which one the last, nonetheless are doing wonderful things around the country and things that the country ought to care about. So one of my principal ambitions, I think I can say this without, again, violating understandings or advice, is to make that case in a very powerful way and to carry the torch for those organizations in the best way that I possibly can.